That's good. First Samuel chapter 30. So if you remember last week, we went to kind of the decline of Saul. So Saul earlier in the chapter lost the kingdom, right? He had uh, disobeyed the Lord. Uh, the, the point where he had really failed God to the point of faith, a, a failure of faith in God. It's not our failures in the natural or we made a mistake. It's our faith not being there. You have to remember Peter uh, in the garden before he failed, before he denied Jesus three times. Jesus said, Peter, I pray for you that your faith fail not. Not that you fail not, because you knew Peter was going to fail. We all fail. We all have these mistakes in our lives. We're all human. We're all living this life in the flesh, right? But it's our faith. It's what God wants to see is that unbroken line of faith throughout our lives. Right? So His Holy Spirit and His grace can work in us to fix what needs to be fixed. We all need a lot. That need, we still have a lot left that needs to be fixed, right? When you got saved, that was like, you know, you were a raging house fire. When you were a, a sinner. And that fire got put out. But that house needs to be rebuilt, right? There's a lot of work, a lot of structural damage, a lot of things that I don't need. I had a lot of structural damage. I was a complete rebuild, tear down and rebuild. And that's what God's doing now. He's building us. And if you're in this process by faith, you know, you are on the right direction. Just because you have a bad day, just because you mess up, doesn't mean you're not on the right path. There's going to be a lot of ways that God's going to chase you. God's going to allow things to remain in your life for a certain reason. And usually that is for you to cry out to God and see your need for Him. Our flesh, it, it, even the smallest opportunity, will try to take hold of our lives, be prideful, and convince us how good we are and how okay we are. And, and God will let things in that will tell us the exact opposite. Say, you're really not. Look at you. Look at the things that still remain in your heart. You're a Christian, you're a believer, you love God. That's not in question. Oh, for that's not, that's not even what I'm talking about at this moment. You love God. You want to live for God. You want to live a holy life. Right? And unfortunately, a lot of the times when the church preaches that, they preach, do this, do that. If you want to be holy, look like this, dress this way, act this way. That's not what it's about. Now, many of those things will manifest themselves on the outside when you're believing the right thing. But it's not a list of do's and don'ts. It's a list of one. Believe. Believe in the same exact thing you believed in when you got saved, which is Christ is going to do everything I ever need. I just need to believe Him to do it and allow Him to do it in my life and not try to take control. Well, Saul wasn't like that. Saul was a man of the flesh. Okay? And everything Saul put his hands on had that mark of the flesh on it. And when he was uh, ordered to go wipe out the Amalekites completely, which were a type of the flesh, he spared the good things. Samuel said, what is this bleeding of sheep I hear? You know, why do I hear sheep? He goes, well, we saved the good sheep. And we saved the way. He's like, who's this guy sitting over here? That? What's the king? We saved the king and the nice sheep. He said, I said to wipe it all out. And that's us as believers too. The flesh has to go. Every last bit of it. We don't say, oh, well, this little thing can stay and that little thing can stay and God can bless this and it's all going to go. Oh, our life has to be completely... So, see, you guys are so lucky because you get a preview to the message I'm going to preach to you. <laughs> That's the reward to coming to Bible study. You get the leg up. So when you hear me preach it before, you go, I already know that. Do we get to leave now? <laughs> no, 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 no. You must stay the whole time. And especially... Well, you can leave after the offer. No, okay. okay. So, all right. That's bad. We'll, we'll delete that. Okay. Uh, so, okay. I'm back on track. Here's the point. The point is, is our life is a surrender to Christ. It's a complete and utter surrender. We think of surrender and battle. Two parties are fighting each other, and one just bows down before the other and says, I quit. And that's what this is. Because that's what our flesh is. Our flesh is this constant fight and animosity against God. It is. We may not try to think of it that way because I'm trying to do good things. How can that be against God? Because you're rejecting His way, His system. That's the same thing Cain did. And that was the illustration of Cain and Abel in Genesis 4 was to say, it doesn't matter how good it looks on the outside. If it's not God's way, it's the devil's way. It's the way of your flesh. Anything that is rebellion against God is sin. God gives you a way. You say, I got a better way. That's sin. It doesn't matter how nice you make it look. I personally, used to give an offering of my own good works. Well, I'll do good things, and I'll do charity, and, and I was rejecting the cross. The cross was right there in front of me, but I was like, no, no, I got all these other things. I'll do this, I'll do that, and my life was a disaster because of it. Because I rejected the one way that God had given. I did not have life and life more abundantly. I did not have the life that came through Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to tell you this. 
and you may look at me funny or throw things at me, I do less things than I did when I, before I was saved than you consider good works. Now, here's the good thing. The things I actually do now, if they're led by God, actually accomplish something. Because the Holy Spirit is behind it. Not me doing it. But the Holy Spirit can anoint and touch it. Example, go out in the street, minister to somebody who's hurting, who's hopeless, they accept Christ. They have now the water that will never run dry. Right? I don't, I don't feel the need to maybe bring them a lot of worldly things like a bottle of water or, or a, a granola bar. I'm not saying that stuff is bad, but listen, that will run out and you'll come back to me. That will run out again, you'll come back to me. But if I give you Christ, right, Christ will meet your need. I mean, that, that's the issue here is I can't meet your needs that you have spiritually. I can't meet your needs that you have physically. Okay, I might be able to do a good thing for you, feed your wants on Thanksgiving or go to a soup kitchen. But if I give you Christ, that's everything. You have access to God now. You have everything you need. You don't need me. You know, good works make you feel, I'm talking about good works outside of the will of God. They make you feel good because somebody needs you. You feel needed. Oh, look at how, how worthy I am to do these things. And, and this person, they wouldn't even survive if I didn't go there and feed them. Right? But then we get the board. So, wipe that all out. Saul. Not a man of God. All right? We see, uh, you know, even David, this was from last week. He went to Ziklag. He was afraid of Saul. So he, instead of just trusting in God and allowing God to operate through his faith, he was operating in fear. He went to Ziklag. He hid from Saul. He was with the Philistines. Saul consults a medium, right, to get his problem solved. Shows you where his head was at. But listen, there's Christians who go to psychologists. Right? I'm telling you that here today. I went to psychologist before I was saved. I thank God that somebody told me, and maybe it's just some people don't know because the church has been so infiltrated with it. It's the biggest Christian colleges, so-called in this country, have psychology on their menu as far as teaching it. Psychology and Christianity are opposites. One says man can fix it. One says God can fix it. That's it. It's complete. You can't add the two together. It doesn't make any sense. It, it's, it's, you're contradicting yourself by doing that. The, the word Christian psychologist is an oxymoron. They're psychologists. That's what they are. Not, it's not, there's nothing Christian about it. Now, there is Christian counseling, but here's the book. Here's the textbook. And that's it. And that's just like a preacher or a teacher guiding you in the Word of God. You know, somebody comes to you and you say, you know, I know you're struggling, brother. I know you're struggling, sister. But God's Word says this. Or you share a testimony of your own life. And so a lot of what we do here, you know, when people share what the Lord's done in their life, is that can minister to somebody's heart, right? And minister just means to attend to the needs of somebody else. And that's what it does. It ministers to your heart. I hear somebody else stand up and say, you know what, I had cancer, I had this, I had that. God never left me. God was with me. God helped me. God healed me. And I say, something in my heart is struck that says, my faith is strengthened. And it says, wow, God did that for them. I'm, I'm just I'm dealing with something pretty little. God can take care of that for me. And my faith is strengthened because that's God's word. It, it's not just reading from the sacred text here. Okay? And trust me, get this right because I'm not trying to add or take anything away from the scripture. But when somebody testifies, that's the application of this to their life. And says, this word is true. Look what this word did for me. I believed God. And God showed up. I believed him and he's never left me. I, I've, I've believed him for decades and he's never failed me. That's God's word of action because God never fails. So now we have uh, kind of the end of uh, Saul's life, which is going to transition into the beginning of David's reign. And I want to pick up in chapter 30, verse 1. And now this is David. So I'm going to give you the, the, just the rundown here. Remember, David goes and hides with the Philistines. They give him the town called Ziklag to live in. All right? Things are good. Even though David is not doing what God has called him to do, the Lord is still with him. Right? God doesn't just leave you. The gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. That doesn't mean that if you're walking in a way outside God's will, there's not going to be consequences. There absolutely will. The law of sin and death is always present. But it doesn't mean that David's calling was gone just because he failed God. Same thing with us. I thank God for that. Or none of us would have a calling because we all failed God. So it would be taken away. So, and God knows that, so that's why it's not based on that. 
But so David does have some of the blessings of God. You see him with, him with God. The Philistines say, okay, this, this guy's good. I mean, the Lord is definitely with him. Or we'll, we'll just kind of leave him alone. And, and then they're about to go to battle. The Philistines are about to go to battle with Israel. And David is walking so far outside the will of God that he's willing to go to battle against Israel on the side of the Philistines. And the Philistines realize how ridiculous that is. Not even David. And they say, get out of here. Because we know what could happen during battle is you'll switch sides and we'll die. So you got to get lost. So then we have, um, okay, so David ends up uh, fighting with the, uh, so the Philistines kick him out, and this is a separate fight. So, so now David is, is coming back to his camp at Ziklag. Chapter 30, verse 1. Now what happened when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south in Ziklag and attacked Ziklag and burned it with fire. And had taken captive the women and those who were there from small to great. And they did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. So the men were about to remember. David and his men were about to go fight on the side of the Philistines. So they were out of their camp. They came back to Ziklag and this is what the Amalekites had done. And remember, the Amalekites were the ones who Saul was supposed to wipe out completely. And if Saul would have done his job and wiped them out completely, this wouldn't happen. It shows you. When you let any little bit of flesh remain in your life, it's going to have a consequence. It's not just going to stay dormant. It's going to try and take over. So David and his men came to the city, and there was burning with fire. And their wives, their sons, their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives, Ananom the Jezreelitess and Abigail the widow of Nabal the Carmelite, had been taken captive. Now David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him. So they're upset. They don't know what David's supposed to be their leader here. And there's just a, a big invasion, people getting captured. They're, they're not happy with David because the soul of all the people was grieved. But every man for his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself and the Lord his God. Then David said to Ahab, and that, I mean, just that, that verse alone, I can sit up here for the next hour and talk about it. David strengthened himself and the Lord. So he's looking at everybody coming against him in the outside. And he realizes his own weakness. And Paul said, God's strength is perfected in his weakness. That's when God's the strongest, when you're the weakest. We don't want to get the weakest, though. It hurts. You know? It doesn't feel good to be weak in, in the flesh. But that is when God takes over. That's when we truly see God's strength. When you're essentially, we'll go back to that word, surrender. Okay? David realized he was in a rough place. I mean, think of what had happened. He starts his life defeating Goliath. A pretty high note. He's anointed, king of Israel. You're going to be the next king. But he doesn't take over the kingship right away. There's a time from the promise till he actually inherits the promise, till it actually happens. He's anointed king of Israel. He defeats Goliath. People are singing his praises. Okay? Then the persecution comes. All right? He's given the calling. He's given the anointing. Then the persecution comes. Saul chases him. What does he do? Does he stand strong in faith and say, listen, I know God has me where he wants me. I know God's going to take care of this. No, he runs away. He runs away by fear. And I'm not knocking David because David was referred to as a man after God's own heart. If I could be referred to as even half that, I'd be happy. So I'm not knocking David here because David did some things right. But that particular instance, he was operating in fear. And he operated in fear, ran to Ziklag, and this is where it had led him to this moment. Right? It does, even if God, you love God and you're saved and you're believing God, you walk outside His will and then you feel God, there's going to be something that's going to come about that's not good. So don't ever think, oh, well, I can just sin and God will forgive it. I'll sin. Thank God for that. Don't, don't use the, His blood as a license to sin. Use it as the liberty to live free from sin. Right? Don't say, oh, I'll just sin and God will fix it. I'll sin and God will fix it. No. Do your best to live a life by faith that allows you to live free from sin. Now, we're not going to be perfect. That, all that means is don't condone your sin. Don't say, yeah. Now that, you know, and there's a whole movement in the church now that says you just do whatever you want. The cross paid for it all. And you realize how close that is to the truth, but how wrong it is? The cross did pay for it all, and thank God. But Paul said in Romans chapter 5, going into chapter 6, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, right? How we were dead to sin live any longer therein. It's, 
It, it's not our license to get away with whatever we can get away with until we go to heaven. That's not what this is. This is a, now you have the power of the Holy Spirit to be in a process where God is fixing you, changing you, and you're living freer from sin every day. That's a blessing. Trust me. You don't want to live in that life of just sinning a lot and being forgiven a lot. You want that to lessen as your life goes on. And I, once again, I'm not preaching perfect uh, perfection here. None of us are going to have that this side of glory. But you should see things changing in your life. If you don't, you need to evaluate what it is that you're trusting. Things should be changing. I'm not saying new things will pop up. I feel like every time I get... Uh, you know, some progress in one area, I see another thing pop up, right? And it's something different. And I go, whoa, I didn't realize that was there, or I thought I had that fixed, or whatever. But that's how much God loves us, is that he's not going to give up this work. He's going to keep changing us. He's going to keep working on us as long as we allow. So, <clears throat> there is no... License, and you don't want it, trust me, because the life you will live being freed from sin, you'll have more peace, you'll have more joy, you'll have more fellowship with God. Because when we live in open sin, open, unrepentant sin, our fellowship with God is degraded. The sin, you don't, God hates sin. I mean, think of it if you had a child, okay, and that child, you, you told them, you know, don't do a certain thing, and they kept doing it and saying, I'm sorry, and kept doing it. And you'd forgive him, but at a certain point you'd say, you got to cut it out, right? Stop doing that. And, you know, here's the thing. As earthly parents, that's all we have. God has a way to let us live free from that through his Holy Spirit, through our faith. And, you know, the fact that the cross did pay it all, allowing the Holy Spirit to work in us, is referred to as the Spirit of grace. That's God's Spirit. He's the Spirit of grace do things in our life that we don't deserve and we can't earn, but that God does based on our, our belief. So that's, that degrades your fellowship with God. And eventually, <clears throat> when you get to a certain point, that relationship can be broken for good as your faith degrades, because that's what sin does. And the devil knows that. And that's why, he, that's why sin to him is so important. That's why he tries to ensnare man in every way he can in sin. Because sin will degrade your faith. Sin is like the devil shooting arrows at your faith. Because the more you sin, the more you are living a life that's separate from God, what God wants. Right? Remember, sin is just rebellion towards God. It doesn't matter if it's murder or if it's just a, a what we would consider a small sin of the heart that nobody sees. It's still rebellion towards God's way. I'm not saying God you, doesn't see murder as worse than one thing or the other. I do believe there is a severity there, but it's all judged the same way. Right? When it comes to our penalty of our soul being lost for eternity. So, alright. The whole point was this. Is that, don't live in sin. Not going to bring anything good. David here, he's seeing what's going on around him because of his sin. And what does he do? He does what he should have done all along. Strengthens himself in the Lord. Trusts in the Lord with all his heart. He says, God, and this is me reading a sin in the text, but I think it's it's bearing witness to the verse, is he's able to be strengthened, and the way we're strengthened in the Lord is through our weakness. He sees it as a surrender. All right, God, I'm ready to do what it is that you want me to do. I know I ran from you. I know I, I turned my back for, for a little while. I'm not saying David wasn't a believer, but he was outside the will of God. Okay, verse 7. Then David said to Abathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, Please bring the ephod here to me. And Abathar brought the ephod to David. So David, oh, this is important. What does he do? So David inquired of the Lord. That's it. That's what you got to do. you got to inquire of the Lord. Shall I overtake them? Shall I pursue this troop? And he answered them, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. So David went, he and the 600 men who were with him, and came to the brook Besor, where those who stayed were left behind. But David pursued, he and 400 men, for 200 stayed behind, who were so weary they could not cross the brook Besor. Now skip down to verse 19. So they got everything back, and nothing of theirs was lacking, either small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything which they had taken from David, 
David recovered all. It just shows even when we fail, God can still help us. He doesn't write us off. He doesn't cast us off. All right, so the end of the uh, chapter is essentially Saul and Jonathan dying in battle. Um, so this brings us to uh, 2 Samuel. So where are we now? So that book that we just read, 1 Samuel, takes us from the year about 1050, let's say. Around the year 1050, because... Well, you have... like So the anointing of Saul is really 1050, so probably even a little bit before that. Probably closer to maybe 1100 B.C. Uh, to about 1010 B.C. So 1010 B.C. is really... Uh, the beginning of David's uh, kingship. So there's 15 years there, 15 years of David's life. He was anointed king. Samuel pours the oil over his head. He defeats Goliath. Oh, David is slain his 10,000. Saul is thousands. They're cheering for him. 15 years he's got to wait for this to come to pass. It doesn't happen instantaneously. That happens with us all the time. God may promise you something. He may show you something. It doesn't happen instantly. Because there was things that were happening... God was testing David's faith. All of this, even everything that he did that we saw there in Ziklag, that was a test of David's faith. Are you going to believe me? David didn't, when he ran to Ziklag, he saw the destruction that it brought with the Amalekites taking everything away. Then he inquired of the Lord, strengthened himself in the Lord, and what happens? He recovers all. Okay? He's back to where he needs to be. So 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel is really the book that starts at Saul's death and ends with the end of David's reign. So it was, it's about 40 years, about 1010 B.C. to about 970 B.C. So now, after David's reign, now we're really going to get into the days of the kings. All right, Solomon isn't, well, I mean, these are the kings of Israel, this, this are, like David's reign, the golden age of Israel. But what happens after Solomon's reign is there's a split. Okay, now we have so we have the period of the judges, in one kingdom of Israel, right? Israel is, is united, 12 tribes. We have Saul's reign, David's reign, Solomon's reign. When Solomon dies, they split. You have 10 tribes to the north, two tribes to the south, Israel and Judah. So they split, in, not in half technically, but in two parts. And that's when kind of everything starts to go a little crazy. The northern kingdom, they never have a chance because they're, they're flawed from the start. I mean, with Jeroboam, they're, they're flawed with worshiping golden calves and their, their idolatry runs through their entire history. Pretty much every king on their side is terrible. Judah, different. Judah has a better shot. Why? Because they have the temple. And Judah was more of God's will because that was Rehoboam. Rehoboam was the one who was supposed to be king. Jeroboam took the throne for himself, right? So he was operating in sin from day one. With Rehoboam, you have godly kings in the lines of Judah. But still, so, and then Israel in 721 B.C., so about after the end of this book, like 270 years, then you have the northern kingdom is gone. They're evaporated. Okay? Samaria is, is taken. The Assyrians come in. They take everybody captive. They resettle the city. And that's why, if you remember in Jesus' day, how the Samaritans, Samarians were so hated. They weren't looked at. Remember the story of the Good Samaritan? All right, there was a reason Jesus told that parable. The Samaritans were not looked at highly by the Jews. Okay, so he talks about, oh, there's a, there's a priest, there's a helper, and a Samaritan. You know, you know, which one does the good thing? And, and which one's, you know, your neighbor? And he's like, the Samaritan, I guess. I mean, he's the one who did the right thing, but oh, I don't like those people. The reason was is because they were looked at as half-breeds between the Assyrians and Israelites because they had uh, taken them over and kind of repopulated with a mix. But Jesus was saying, it doesn't matter. Okay? A follower of me is a follower of me. Wherever they're from, whatever they look like, it's about their hearts, about their faith, and not where they come from. All right, so 2 Samuel. Chapter 1, David finds out of Saul's death. He mourns, and he still refers to Saul as the Lord's anointed. He even, there's a guy who comes to tell him who's an Amalekite of Saul's death. And he goes, you know, how do you feel comfortable even, even talking about the Lord's, and he kills the guy right there about the Lord's anointing. And David, that shows you that David was a man after God's own heart. Right there. All the things that Saul did, the wickedness of Saul, David was still obedient to God. Because you know, God had showed him and told him, listen, until Saul's gone, 
until I open that door for you, until I take that next step. Saul's the one in charge. He's the king. All right? David didn't ever try and steal the kingship for himself. He never tried to take it by force. He waited on God. He allowed God to open that door, and he did it. Chapter 2, David is now anointed king, so it took him 15 years to receive the promise that Samuel had given to him in 1025 B.C. So now we're going to chapter 5. So we have a couple battles in David's early um, kingship. Chapter 5, so if you remember back in 1 Samuel, Israel, this is even before Saul, Israel, in their error, go to battle, and they bring the Ark of the Covenant with them. All right? Now, see if anybody knows here. Was the Ark of the Covenant made to go into battle? No. The Ark of the Covenant sat, right, in the, in the Holy of Holies, in the tabernacle, with the cherubim, God's presence rested between them. A very specific purpose. The priests came in once a year, sprinkled blood on the mercy seat, the sins of Israel were atoned for. It says nothing about it going to battle as a, as a kind of a magic wand to help you defeat your enemies. The only way it was moved was it was transported by the Levites, who were priests, a very specific way. There were rings in the top. There was poles made out of acacia wood, go for wood. They were slid into the rings, and it was carried in a procession, very specifically. They take this thing, bring it out, say, all right, let's bring it to battle. It will help us with our enemies. Not God's way. Not God's will. Gets captured. Philistines get their hands on it. They go, oh, we got this ark now. Now it'll, now it'll help us. Well, they start breaking out boils and sores and get sick, and it's cur a curse to them. So they eventually bring it back, and they give it to, uh, it, it actually ends up in the house of Abinadab, all right, and, which was a, a godly man, I guess. It doesn't say much about him in 1 Samuel 6 and 7. And it sits there for a while, anywhere up to it's like 50, 60 years, it, it sits there. But it's not where it's supposed to be. It's not sitting in the tabernacle. And David, listen, this is very important. David does the right thing, but he does it the wrong way. David knows that the Ark of the Covenant belongs in the Holy of Holies. He knows God's work. He knows what to do. But he doesn't go about it the right way. So let's start in chapter 6. So David goes to bring the ark back. We've got to get the ark back where it belongs. It's not. It's, there's accounts, and listen, extra biblical accounts are just this. They could be anything. But there were accounts it was sitting in a barn. It was sitting out in a field, out in the elements. And by the way, the ark of the covenant has been found, so we don't know where it is. It, who knows? Maybe it'll reappear at some point. Chapter 6, verse 1. Again, David gathered all the choice men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people who were in him from Baal Judah. Now, here's in, in First Chronicles, which First Chronicles, the book of First Chronicles, is First and Second Samuel. Okay? Remember this. When you think of the, the historical books, First Chronicles is First and Second Samuel combined. It's just a duplicate account with some different additional things out of it. And Second Chronicles is First and Second Kings. So you have... 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings combined into 1st and 2nd Chronicles. But in 1st Chronicles, which is an account of 1st and 2nd Samuel, it says that David consulted with the captains of thousands and hundreds and with every leader. Okay. Does it say he consulted with God? Does he say he inquired of the Lord? No. But it says that for a reason. Because he consulted with man. David arose and went, this is verse 2. David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal Judah to bring up from there the Ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts who dwells between the cherubim. So they set the Ark of God on a new cart. Anybody see anything wrong yet? And brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drove the new cart. Do you see anything wrong with this? Remember what I talked about with the poles and the acacia wood and the Levites? Doesn't say anything about a new car and Uzzah and uh, what is the guy, Io or whatever his name was, pushing a new car. You know who did that was the Philistines. That's how the Philistines transported it. The Philistines are of the world. They don't serve God. They serve statues. 
They sacrificed their children in the fire. That's the Philistines. Ungodly, heathen people. And I'm not talking about them as a nation, because anybody who's a Philistine can say, I don't want to do this. I want to be saved. I want God and be saved, just like now. I'm not what I'm demeaning that, demeaning that belief system of idolatry, not their nationality. I care less, because anybody can be saved from anywhere. But they were ungodly folks. That they looked at a new cart as, oh, that's nice. Let's take some, some brand new oxen that have never been yoked in a new cart. Let's make it look nice. That's Cain. That's the same thing Cain did. Cain tried to make a real nice looking offering so that God would be impressed with his work rather than just obeying God. It's so much easier to obey God. Well, in the end, it is. A lot of times our flesh says, well, the easiest thing is just to do what your flesh says and do it in a nice way and, and you'll get credit for it. Because God will say, oh, well, that's a real nice heart. That's, but that's not the point of this. Because then God doesn't get the glory. God always gets the glory. Verse 4. So they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, accompanying the ark of God. And Ahio went out before the ark. Then David and all the house of Israel played music before the Lord on all kinds of instruments, and firwood, and harps, and stringed instruments, and tambourines, and sistrums, and cymbals. Wow. That sounds like a great procession right there. Still, it was not of God. It was not God's way. I don't care how pretty you make it. I don't care how many, you know, different kinds of things you got going on in your church. If it's not of God, no one's going to be blessed. And actually, there's something else that's going to happen. Let's see in the next verse. And when they came to Nashon's threshing floor, Uzzah put his hand to, uh, to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. And God had enough at this point. And the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah. And God struck him there for his error. And he died there by the ark of God. So death. When you go about things that are not God's way, death will come. I'm not saying the wrath, the, 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 the wrath of God striking people dead will happen every time you step outside the, the will of God. We'd all be gone. It can happen. But... I'm saying is there's going to be a death physically, spiritually, separation from where you need to be, from you and God. So the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah and he got struck down. Verse 8, and David became angry because of the Lord's outbreak against Uzzah. So he got mad at the Lord. Not at him, he didn't realize his error yet, but he got mad at the Lord. And he called the name of this place Perez Uzzah to this day, which is, it just meant an outburst against Uzzah. David was afraid of the Lord that day, and he said, How can the ark of the Lord come to me? So David could not, would not move the ark of the Lord into the city of David, but David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, for three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his house. And I'm going to get this in a minute. Now it's told King David, The Lord had blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him, because the ark of God. So David went out and brought up the ark of God to the house, from the house of obed even to the city of David with gladness. Okay? So, why? Why was the house of obed even blessed? What was that matter? So David finally stopped and he inquired of the Lord. You see, David asking God a question. That is what God wanted all of That's what we should do all of before anything else, before anything else happens. Before you make any plans, before you go any direction, God, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to do it? God will show you. He'll help you. Sometimes we feel like that voice gets fainter and fainter, but it's always there. Sometimes you have to step out by faith and allow the Lord to guide you. What happened was, is because of David's faithfulness there, who didn't happen at the beginning, that, that's the story of David, his life. You gotta realize, God knows we're gonna fail, but are we gonna get to a point where we're gonna seek God? When we see this happen, are we going to seek God? And that's what David always does. He fails. David's life is a story of this, and we're already seeing it. And we haven't even gotten into the worst of what David does so far. All right? When it comes to his sins with, uh, with Bathsheba and his census of Israel, we haven't even got to the worst of David's life as far as his mistakes yet. But we already see a pattern. Right? We saw a pattern with Ziglag. We see a pattern here. And this is why David was called a man after God's own heart. Because David fails God. David seeks God. David's restored by God. That's what happens. And that's the model of our own life. We fail God. We seek God. We're restored by God. And we seek God in a manner of repentance. 
God, I know I've messed up. I'm sorry. I want your work. Show me the way. And oftentimes it takes us to get to that point, most of the time it takes us to get to that point, before we'll truly see God's way. We almost got to try and feel it out ourselves. Screw it up a little bit. To realize, well, we can't do it. But this new card, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish with this today, because I don't know that we need to go any deeper than that. The second Samuel. But this new card is extremely important. It's extremely important you understand kind of what the, uh, the theme is behind this. And like I said, very similar to Cain's era, but the church of the dead today. And when I say this, I say it because of what I see, what I read, what I hear, what I, I'm exposed to when I choose to venture out into that realm. The largest ministries of, of this world, and I judge that by the, the size of the publications and books, the size of the television ministries, the size of their stadiums that they're preaching in, the amount of space and people that they have. The largest ones today in the world are, are preaching false messages. Most of it is, it has to do with word of faith. And what it is, is it's the love of money. It's the love of material goods. Now you see, you know, we got to just turn on the TV. The love, money is not wrong. There's nothing wrong with money. It's the love of money. Remember, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Not money, but the love of it. And that's what when you constantly have preachers who are up preaching every week about what God's going to give you and what God wants to give you and give you, and it's all material stuff. You rarely hear about spiritual blessings of peace, love, joy, kindness. God's going to free you from sin. He's going to give you a life and a life more abundantly. It's not about that. It's about material things. What you can put in the bank account. What you can put in the driveway. That's what you're hearing. Okay? And that is the love of money. That is materialism. That is not seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And letting whatever God wants to bless you with be added to you. That's all we have to do. Don't you realize how easy this walk is? It really is. All we got to do is seek God first. His kingdom, His righteousness through His word. We seek Him through His Word. We seek Him through prayer. God, we need You. And He'll add to us everything that we need. You don't have to seek that stuff. But what they've done is the opposite. They seek ye first the things of the world, the materialism. And then if a little bit of this gets added to you, okay, great. The Word in many of these places is used as a lure to bring you in, to give you what they really want to give you. This is not the meat of it. This is not the real message. You're given just enough of the word to deceive the Christian, to coming in, to hearing about all the material things. And guess, I mean, you see, some of the things that you see in these churches, I mean, you can tell there's no discernment in that church. I've seen preachers, where, and you may have seen this too, they, they have people come up tied, dump their money on the altar, and the preachers dance over the money. I mean, you think I'm joking. You really do. This goes on in big ministries. Ministries that major networks will put on on early Sunday morning. I'm not talking about some fringe, some like these, these, because there's the wackos too, which they're, and if you're not preaching the word of God, you're all a wacko. But I'm talking about ones that are, they have a big following. This is out there. This is real. We can't bury our head in the sand to this. But this is the defense against the blood of Christ and this word. But this new cart encapsulates most of the church right now. It's unfortunate. And, and I blame and I point the finger at pastors who are about my age, my generation, is falling headlong into a lot of this. I thank God that there still are people who stand on the Word, who say, we don't need tricks, we don't need gimmicks, we don't need gadgets, we just need the Word of Almighty God, and that's what's going to change hearts and souls. But there's many who don't. And many of them feel that desire and need to be loved by the world. We can't let the world down. We, got, we can't say something that's too offensive. We have to have a new cart. We have to have something that the world approves of. I don't care if the world approves of this message. I could care less. What I care about is when I stand before God one day, which I will, is that I can stand there with a clean conscience and say, God, I, I taught him the word to the best of your ability, to the best of my ability. I taught this word the best I understood it. And I know I made plenty of mistakes, and I'm sorry for them. And and, and hope that the Lord is merciful to me, which I know He will be. Because He's merciful, not because of me, but because of Him. 
But I can't imagine being in the shoes of some of these men, women and God, who are going to have to stand before God when they account for what it is that they taught people. Because this is not just a, oh, well, somebody had a bad day because of what I taught. Souls are being lost. Okay? There, there may be people who are saved in those churches who are, are believing this nonsense and walk away from God because it's, it's so corrupt. And there may be just masses and masses who come in and never knew God. But the point of the new card is this. God has a way. Right? And it hasn't changed since the Garden of Eden. Okay? It's obedience to His plan. And it's obedience to the blood. Right? If we just trust in Christ every day, then what He's done in this life is enough. Everything that we ever need in this life is already accomplished. What, like David, whether we receive all of it yet, because David has got the promise, he had everything he needed in 1025 BC, but it was 15 years later that he sat on that throne. Right? We're not sitting on that throne yet. We're not reigning in heaven as, as, as uh, you know, kings and priests, and reigning and ruling with Jesus Christ yet. We're still here. But it's going to happen. And everything that that for that to take place has already been paid for. It's already been bought. We just need to trust in Christ every day that whatever we encounter, right, He already has the answer for it. And He can be the one who can help us. And not try to devise new ways, new methods, new techniques to solve a problem that Christ has already solved. Amen? That was for me. Heavenly Father, we thank You. We praise You for Your Word, Lord. We thank You that it's true. We can stand on it. We can build our lives on it. We can strengthen our faith in it, Lord. And allow me never to say or preach anything that's not in your word, Lord Jesus, because I know that brings destruction and death. Lord, if it's not in here, Lord, it's not going to help anybody, myself included, and I don't want that. I need what you have for us, Lord. You have change that you want to do in all our hearts, Lord, and allow us to let you do that. Don't let us frustrate your spirit, frustrate your grace. Allow us to just allow you to work, to surrender it over to you, to let you take our lives and make them what they need to be. Because only you know, Lord, you created us. You see the end from the beginning. You see where you want to take us. We don't. We can't even see what we're going to have for dinner tonight. We don't even know what tomorrow's going to hold. But Lord, you know all. And we ask that you just take over and take control of our lives. And we thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Good job.